a very interesting segment. A panel discussion on whether the stock market term one brands sacrifice brand building for short term profits. We have with us Mr. B. Kamarajan, Managing Director of Blue Star Limited, Mr. Arnab Banerjee, CEO of the CF Limited, and Ms. Ann Engel, Mahalakshmi, Senior Consulting Editor of Money Control. And also the moderator for the session is going to be Mr. Vikram Sakuja, the partner and group CEO of Madison Media and OOH. So with this and your round of applause, I'd now like to request our panelists along with our moderator to kindly uh, join us. Okay, yes, I can see the setup also being uh, happy, but please uh, just stay tuned. Uh, I'd meanwhile request you all to please uh, also hashtag, hashtag PMER2022. We just request our speakers to just uh, sit down for the moment uh, while the stage is getting ready for the panel. Thank you all for joining us. So ladies and gentlemen, this is going to be an exciting panel discussion. We have with us Mr. E. Kyabrajan, uh, we've got Arna Banerjee, and Mahalakshmi, and the moderator of the session is going to be Mr. Vikram Sikhuja, who will be joining us. So as I can see the stage now being uh, ready, and the mics being put on the podium. Uh, we just request with your warmest and thunderous round of applause, ladies and gentlemen, requesting our panelists to kindly please join us. Thank you so much. Aha, hi Petty, and things are just very warmed up now. Uh, really, very honored and privileged to be moderating this very eminent panel. We have Arnab who has Siat, Pia who has Yusta, and Mahalashmi who is Money Control. We have a pretty interesting problem on our hands today. You can read behind me. The motion is really that stock markets reward companies that sacrifice brand building for quarterly profits. Who better to deliberate on this than a person who studies the markets every day and of course two CEOs have to battle every quarter with results and their businesses. I'm hoping to gain some insights about how, what are the compulsions and what are the kind of ways in which we can actually overcome stock market pressures and actually uh, have marketing work without constraints. So I'm going to dive right in. I'm hoping to go through this have a nice and tight panel, so I'm hoping to cover this panel three or four times. I'm going to start by trying to establish a link between markets and quality results. So yeah, let's start with you. Markets really await the quality results of companies. Are there any deliberations within company management on how markets are likely to react to the quarter's results? Good uh, afternoon. Thank you, Vikram. Uh, congratulations to Madison for uh, yet another impressive report. Um, so it's a privilege to be part of this panel. Uh, I am in this game for uh, many, many years. Uh, Sir CNBC or ET now and others. In fact, uh, like coincidence, tomorrow morning I have an ET now which you have said. I don't think uh, uh, we should be or we are looking at the stock market price in determining the, uh, uh, in determining the stock market price, what will the outcome in thinking about the quarterly results about? It's an outcome of what you deliver in a quarter. So you have very little control over how the stock market will behave. So therefore, what uh, I would be, or what the CEO should be interested in, that it is the shareholder value creation we are supposed to do. And for that, the results are very important. So shareholder value creation in short term different and long term should be different and the stock market behaves in a different manner altogether. But my belief is that in the long run, as long as you create the value, you will get the right valuation. 
So there is no point in trying to do things day to day, keeping in mind the stock. So if, if I may, uh, can you lift it on that? Are you saying quarterly results are, when, whatever you have to report, uh, you really aren't worried too much about what the stock market is going to think? Not at all. And I, I also believe that nobody should be worried about that as well. Because you, you, what, what is the role? The role is for the, for the board or the top management is to deliver results in line with the strategy. And the stock market is behaving based on your potential to deliver or what you actually deliver. In that context, you, uh, it is important that you deliver good results. And in that process, I am saying, don't worry about the stock market price of today or tomorrow at all. Stock market will react. But if you consistently deliver results, you will get the valuation you want. And most importantly, forget the stock market because you are, you know, you are talking about the stock market as an umpire of this. Uh, look at the CEO himself in the quarterly results. Uh, CEO's uh, own uh, performance incentive or the variable pay can, uh, can be impacted because we are not a country with so much of ease of uh, in the float or uh, we are, our compensation is not majority of the companies are not linked to stock market price at all. There are, in US you will find the stock market valuation of the developed markets. It is there, it is there in some companies in India. So therefore, your goal is to deliver results as expected of you. Do not worry about the stock market price at all. That, that sounds comforting. We'll come back to that. Anand, you joined CIA in 2005 before it went public. Are the PNL pressures any different once you list the company? No, oh, CIA was completely different. It was then, I thought it was a big problem. I thought it was a big problem. No, it was completely different. So, yeah, so I would tend to agree with uh, what uh, you just said. Uh, and I would like to uh, add uh, something to that, is that uh, uh, it's all about uh, a consistent story to all stakeholders, including uh, the stock market investors, uh, including your uh, partners, business partners, and the employees within. So you cannot just uh, swing in and swing out of a strategy in a quarter-to-quarter -quarter basis. And as long as the story is cogent and consistent, uh, consistent, I think all the stakeholders are mature enough to understand where you are going and what you are going to do. So uh, if there are, um, the results are a little up and down because of factors uh, which uh, are short term, um, uh, your inputs and outputs will be a little up and down. As long as the story is cogent, and you have clear uh, view of that and you share it with all the stakeholders transparently. Um, I think uh, that's the way to go and people understand that. Story is more important than the results. Malakshmi, Mal you have to, actually you bring the reality check into this entire thing. As agencies, we sometimes feel that clients suddenly bring the axe down on, on budgets every quarter, uh, even though the top line goal seems to be there. Seems to be that water protection, the product protection seems to be a uh, uh, concern. How do you think markets behave? Are they really rewarding revenue, profit, consistency, sharp gains? What is your take? Would you, would you agree with, with these panel speakers? Am I okay? So I need to on this that I don't want to sit in judgment about um, how this works really because saying is. Uh, as true as what these gentlemen are saying. That is why I brought the numbers. So I just, we just looked at like a very quick match to see what is the add to sales ratio for the last uh, 15 years and how do they correlate with uh, stock market returns on a quarterly basis, including some amount of lead time. So because the results come in like, you know, 15 days late or so uh, and so on. And as it turns out, there is absolutely zero correlation between ad spends and stock market returns. And I'll, I'll, I'll tell you some of the start numbers. You know, Imami, uh, the year where they spent the most, okay, which is 19% of sales, was 2018. And that is the year where the stock market return was paltry at 1.24%. Okay, so uh, I have numbers for Godrej Consumer, HUL, ITC, and all of this, and 
ITC is absolutely classic because they've had a steady at the sales ratio for the last 15 years. For the first 5-7 years it's 3%, next 5-7 years it's 2% and nothing can be more erratic than their yearly performance uh, over the past few years. So there is, uh, when you articulate this discussion saying that uh, sacrificing quarterly profits, uh, uh, stock markets do not reward companies that build brand, you have uh, you know, and sacrifice, uh, sacrifice building brands and prioritize that over uh, uh, quarterly profits, it presupposes that there is a positive correlation between them. And that's not true at all. At least that's not what the numbers of the top five, six consumer no, companies tell. This is brilliant. We are less than 10 minutes into the panel discussion and all three of my eminent panelists have absolutely dismissed the notion. But I'm going to bash on regardless. So again, I'm going to come to you, Tia. Is it a myth that we find that uh, if you have an annual plan and an annual budget, there are quarter by quarter, it's almost like in a September suddenly you see budgets fall, all in these, likewise in a December, likewise in a month, especially in a month. Then why is that? Is that a is that is that a wrong observation? Because we definitely see a quarter to quarter behavior. So is that happening within the company management and it's got nothing to do with the, the stock market? Yeah, uh, that's why I, I, I firmly believe uh, star, we should not be uh, you know, uh, judging the stock market at all. They are not into this at all. Uh, they, as, as she pointed out, uh, stock market behavior is irrespective of what you are spending advertising specifically on other things. I, I'll tell you where you are there with me. Uh, number one is it is the top management or the CEO's decision if at all he is going to be controlling certain expenses. Now, uh, whether he will be doing it in order to produce a result, uh, the answer is yes, he, he, he can do. It is being done. Uh, I will plan about it. He can be doing it. Now, but then, you can do it only for a very short period of time, in, in exceptional circumstances. Let us say, for example, that uh, there is a pandemic and uh, there is chaos, there is a huge uncertainty. At that point of time, you want to control the expenses, you will go ahead and do. But in the history of the company, in the long term, he cannot be using it as a tool that every quarter he is going to be doing it. If he is doing so, or if he, if he is thinking he is budgeting something and he is maneuvering with this, his business is anyway going to suffer. So the fundamental truth is what? The CEO's goal is not to spend advertising expenses. CEO's goal is to deliver the results as per the strategy. Now, uh, we will also talk about it. That is, if CEO so autonomous, he can do anything, so there is a government structure. So therefore, I am keeping stock market out of it. They don't interfere in your what you spent, what you did, didn't spend at all. The, there is a board which is approving the strategy and the strategic goals and the vision for the company. So it may have a market share, goal, let us say, or a revenue growth share. Now, in that strategy, you will know like have a competitive landscape, what should be the mix and where you have to invest. Invest in terms of capital expenses, invest in terms of revenue expenditure, invest specifically in terms of advertising because we are here in the Madison Advertising Report. Advertising is an important today. And if they are going to be looking at human resources, what you are going to invest in. So broadly, the board has done, board has looked into it, has approved the strategy. The, the decision right on approving the strategy is with the board, definitely. Now, I also believe the board's decision is not what is the advertising expert. They are not approving the advertising expert. They are approving your broad strategic goals and the direction that you are taking and the resources that you are going to be allocating. The very first thing you have to ask is whether the board composition has the competent people to be advising and arriving at. Because they are not interested in the executive day-to-day -day role at all. So that is also is defined, it is a mature thing today. You are supposed to be disclosing what is your board composition, there are competencies that are required or available within the board or not. Okay. The next part of it is connected with the executive. He can, in the quarter, do, as I mentioned, you are in extreme circumstances. If he is going to be deviating that, 
the board has definitely a say, look, you produce profit by cutting down certain expenses. Now, in Bruce we follow a practice, even for a variable day of uh, general manager sales or vice president, the profit additional that is shown by cutting down an investment that is required will not be accounted as a profit at all. We, we had established this practice. The yeah, yeah. vice president of a particular division should net a target by cutting down an advertising expenses that is removed. So he cannot be saying I produce this profit other than the company as a whole, as an informed decision, board was told that we have cut down this decision. It's the same for a capital expenditure. I can, why are we discussing advertising about a yeah, capital expenditure, a company can go in a different, let's say a digital or anything. So therefore, there are checks and balances. My view is that whether they are doing, they may be doing for one quarter or two quarters, if he is consistently going to do it, if he is going to pay a price, the business will suffer, board has every right to question. And now, when next year he comes back for the budget, the, he has to explain, he has not spent the money, he budgeted something, and how he can be asking for. Unless or until the board is so very blind. Okay, let me just move on up on this one. Uh, Tiag and Patrick, you said this uh, sort of basically said that it's a strategy, no global business plan, and that's what you're working to. But then why do we get the feeling that the one cost which is probably the easiest to cut is marketing? And because that is a big cost, is not, you can't cut raw material costs at all immediately. At least in one's experience, one has been in organizations, not necessarily just listed ones, where you, it has been used as a tool to show up profits when you actually do profit protection by budget cuts. Now, if the A, do you believe this happens? Because at least I think it's, it's pretty obvious to, it's to me that it does. In which case, the question then becomes, why is it that brand building, which requires more investments, long-term investments, and typically the value of a brand building manifests itself in a good bill of the balance sheet. As against spends which actually add up to PL. I get the sense that the PL is being given the focus over long-term balance sheet goodwill. Am I is my assertion correct or not? No, I think it's not a zero one kind of situation. Uh, if uh, Anyone states that uh, the advertising budget is left untouched because of profit pressures, that is untrue. But uh, will it go to 50% uh, cut, 0%, uh, I mean 100% cut, that's also untrue. So uh, you have to navigate uh, the whole thing uh, by looking at uh, the realities quarter and quarter. But the fact is that uh, it's not a discretionary spend, it is a strategic spend. Okay? So, if there are people who make it zero for two, three quarters, they will suffer. Uh, the awareness level of the brand will go down. The, uh, the uh, uh, you know the action orientation towards the brand will go down, uh, and market share will go down. So there is a consequence of long-term uh, erosion of market share, business, and profits if you just focus on the short term. So yes, some amount of uh, up and down does happen, and I think there is nothing wrong with that. It should happen. Uh, and uh, if you do it short term, uh, let's say if you cut it by 20-30%, uh, no, no permanent damage happens. Yes, awareness will go down a little bit, but the brand health parameters are bad, that's not impacted. So if you can glide through the waters like that and, and uh, nicely, uh, then it is perfectly okay and there's nothing wrong in that. Um, and, and it happens. So as long as you are cogent with the long term story of uh, uh, how much time will you take uh, Let's say, let's say that there is an existing brand which is throwing cash into the operation and you also uh, have new businesses and new brands coming up, right? So, um, they will not generate cash, they will, they will uh, you can call it loss funding or you can call it respectfully strategic funding, whatever you want to call it. So, there has to be a story behind that. I may have an appetite of funding it for 2 years or 20 years. As long as I have that appetite, transparently share, share with all stakeholders, everybody listens and everybody understands what I'm doing. And in a quarter to quarter scenario, yes, it can go down by 20%, it can go up by 30%, that's fine. Absolutely fine. Okay. So, actually, we are hearing that there needs to be a consistent story which the market buys into. We also see that when the likes of Nikas and Zomatos, without any profit lists, they get a reasonably good reception. 
there is a little bit of a meat in our food, but they did get a good reception. But when it comes to legacy companies, every quarter when you guys report, the only thing the headline says is net up so much and or sales up so much. I don't see a single thing about a story which says a client so many more people or, or anything like that's all. So if story is everything, that's not what you guys put in your headlines. So what's your story? You are absolutely right. <laughs> so, so, uh, so, 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 so this is half truth, although, you know, if I were to say uh, seriously, this is half truth. Markets, from a stock market perspective, it is absolutely true that in the near term or even in the medium, medium term, markets buy into narratives and stories. And only over a period of time are you tested. Um, so I, I don't think I will dismiss uh, the market reception to Nike or any of the other companies because we have to understand the context of what is driving this whole thing. About, um, if you go back to the Great Depression period, at that time markets were looking at cash as a proxy for company's value and they would value a company based on cash because lots of companies didn't have business but they had huge amount of cash in their books. So the metric that was used was earnings to cash and uh, or uh, net assets and so on. And then there was a period in the US when money started picking up, uh, the IBS came up and brands started getting built up and people started, you know, with Buffett and, you know, followers of Buffett. They said that we will place our faith in companies that can create large brands and which are, which are, which become cash machines and therefore we will be able to, uh, we are willing to value the company not for its assets but based on the earnings that they will throw up. Now we have come to a situation where you, uh, in this digital space, as it turning, it's, it's turning out to be a pillar take off kind of market, where you get to dominate a certain space and the profit pool in that in that space. So the competition intensity in businesses is changing, and digital companies and you know entirely had an oligopoly. Now competition commission is coming down on that, and these companies are probably going to be monopolies or duopolies and that means that you are going to be able to dominate a huge profit pool and that is what the, uh, the markets are right now discounting. Of course there is a lot, a lot of exuberance because of you know easy liquidity and all of that but we don't need to get there. So uh, in the traditional companies, I think one of the things that also powers these companies is they are able to raise a lot of cash and there is a bit of uh, greater food theory that plays out there. That you know that somebody is going to come and buy out and therefore uh, the gravy train can go on. In larger companies, largely their ability to throw away, why is it that today, isn't it clear to Rajiv Bajaj that electric vehicles is going to be a big thing? You know, why is it that they are not putting in money out there? I think the important thing to understand whether it is Nike or Ola or uh, any other company, the brand the way the markets look at it, brand is supposed to deliver for the company and it is valued only for the economic value or economic returns that, that, that can generate. And as long as the market is able to see that uh, the brand creation exercise will yield returns in a respectable period of time, these days it's, you know, we could talk about 30 years also, um, uh, the market will receive it well. So there is a narrative because you are saying, for example, Uber is a classic case. Uber have, has openly said that they, are, they don't see the company making profits. Why is it valued today at 70 billion dollars? Because they have convinced the world that they are going to be either the number one or number two player in you know uh, 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 ride hailing uh, services across the world. And if I remember correctly, when they came out with an IPO. Uh, the initial price was one tenth of what it was finally pegged at. Uh, uh, because, I mean, why they were still a private company? Because they said that the addressable market was no longer just US, they hoped to address the entire world. And that pretty much changed the calculation that investors bought into that. So today, even in Nike's case, if Nike had been valued very differently, if it were still only in the cosmetic space, 
and we are buying into that, uh, they, are, they are able to attract a lot more value because they have been able to demonstrate that they will be able to replicate that success even in the fashion space which is much bigger. So there is a lot of storytelling and narrative in it. At the same time, you, at some point in time, these things will have to come through and they have to deliver those economic returns for the that's a, that's a fascinating uh, sort of thread that you picked up. And they are welcome to that because what I've really got out of this is there are CEOs and there are CEOs. There seem to be some CEOs and I uh, profess to be one of them who's conditioned to be thinking that I have to deliver top line, bottom line. And there are the others like Uber and Elon Musk of Tesla who will not even talk about any of this and they just talk about completely changing the entire dimensions of the way the world should be looked at. What is your, uh, because if the stock market is not determining this and it's really the company management that is doing it, it's really coming down to the how CEOs are seeing what their measure of success is. What's your perspective? So, yeah, uh, ironically, what you mentioned, they do have a good is to, uh, they need to have to cut the cost. Advertising is very easy to do. A employee headcount reduction or a salary reduction is a very painful process. Uh, it, it, and connected with capital expenditure, it is not you can do it. Yeah. And, and uh, in one minute, half a day, things can be done uh, to cut the advertising expenses. That is true, ironically. Now, uh, having dealt with quarterly results for over 15 years, uh, my uh, I think is the the uh, uh, first problem is with the companies. You are writing the quarterly research press report in a typical way, talking about the numbers. And uh, the you can write about other intangibles you have done and the press doesn't take notice of it. That's the truth. Now in a five minute interview in a television channel, uh, it is uh, these that are talked about and you will not be, you will not be having an opportunity to talk about the intelligence in public advertising. Next one is there are uh, CEOs who will be able to talk about the brand, but if you take the total universe, the number of CEOs who will come forward to talk about the brand, brand building expenses will be very limited. Now, uh, I am not worried so much about the press, they are important. But an informed investor community is the analyst fund managers who have spent time with you to understand your long-term strategy or the new product categories you are getting into, how you are going to be uh, positioning yourself and therefore yeah, if, if you are going to be spending in advertising, whether it has a correlation with your market share goals and initially you will spend more, this long-term long -term story you have an opportunity to tell that. But in quite a few companies, you leave that job to a CFO. And when CEO is talking, he may not be covering it. I have seen this, that you, you can pick up today 50 analyst report. I can share it with you. There it is being talked about, about the brand building or the advertising expenses. It is not as there at all. It will talk about the margin, it will talk about raw material prices, it will talk about capacitation, new categories, you are getting into merger acquisition. It's not talking about advertising, they are not trained to, the people who are dealing with them or the analysts who are discussing with you, they are also not attaching the value. That is the issue. At the end of the day, if I have to succeed, I need the revenue growth that will come from the market share. Or I create new categories. Now, for that, I need to invest in brand I am not saying advertising alone, but a number of other things that are supposed to be done. And there, I am supposed to be investing, I am of the view, stock market will recognize that, not only in the new economy, in the conventional legacy uh, businesses, the stock market will, uh, will grant you that, that you are supposed to be investing, I do not pay about it. But we are not doing a proper communication out there. We are believing it is only bottom line that is important. But I think you may tell that the stock market should share with you the data, because you are one quarter or two quarter is down, they are not bringing down the so, in fact, for this other, today's newspaper itself had this very interesting headline that the choice is being given to the company whether they need to separate the chairman and the managing director. It's not going to be sort of pushed down on any one company. Do you think this is opening up an opportunity for companies to pick out two directors? The chairman, who can actually 
actually uh, manage the stakeholders with stories. Maybe it can be a more than just a top line, bottom line kind of story. Or do you think the CEOs, or do you agree with the argument? Do you think the CEOs also need to broaden their narrative from maybe a very PL oriented point of No, I think uh, the role of the chairman and the board is quite different uh, from the operating team. And the operating team is led by the CEO. And um, uh, I, I do not see the chairman coming into this kind of a role of handling stakeholders, especially investors. Uh, it is the CEO's role, and uh, uh, it depends on uh, the orientation of the CEO in particular. I partially agree with that, but uh, uh, I have seen CEOs uh, giving a completely different picture, which is um, uh, more holistic or more skewed towards brand building and uh, even R&D focus in some cases. So it depends on the company that he represents, it depends on the values or, or uh, the vision that he represents and brings to the table. Uh, and uh, the journey that he's going to take in the next five to ten years, uh, including the next two, three quarters. Uh, so uh, 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 yes, there are people who cover a wide gamut of uh, things, right? Uh, including brand, spends. Uh, spends is just an uh, input to it. Uh, so I don't see really the board or the chairman coming into it. It's the executive which will keep doing it, uh, and it has to do the job well. If, if, if the executive team thinks that brand is important for his business and brand loyalty or uh, uh, is important for market share gains, etc., he'll bring that to play in the story that he shares. Okay, great. I think I have time for just about one more uh, round in which, look, I think the if I have to just summarize where we are in the panel discussion right now, it almost seems that the stock market is completely irrelevant to the functioning of the company. That is what the management is all responsible for. So if we are really talking about budgets going up and down, we shouldn't find a scapegoat in a share, share market. That is entirely the doings of the company. However, over time there has to be obviously a certain performance that the company is sort of uh, it's just, it's, yeah, it's delivering and, and they are communicating. Uh, because the stock market is not irrelevant. That is not discussed. Uh, yeah, it was, that, I mean, that was uh, a, a huge stretch. I think stock market is very relevant because it is a reflection of how the market is looking forward on the company. And uh, if we are getting uh, a value same as industry, better than industry peers, worse than industry peers, it's an input to us. Uh, is my, is I, am I getting re-rated, de-rated, it's an input to us. So there is huge value uh, from the stock market and there is so much scrutiny in the public space. And there are certain, sometimes blind spots also do come up for management. As to say, there is something that we need to focus on going forward. So it's it's part of the ecosystem, it's like any other stakeholders and we value that. What, what is your take at this point in time on the investor maturity? Do, are, are they able to see through the results and actually uh, see the strength of the company? I think I would uh, like to shine the mirror to ourselves. If we share what we want to share and what we believe in, which is going to produce results not only next quarter but quarter after quarter, investors are definitely listening. They listen and they appreciate that. Okay. Yeah, and then of course the performance has to live up to that uh, uh, expectation. And, and they are, do you think institutional investors lead the thinking in this and retail investors follow or do retail investors have a mind and voice of their own? Uh, but India is moving towards largely institutional investors. Uh, the mutual funds are growing and uh, the retail investor is, uh, he, is not uh, going to create that valuation identical. It is the, in, in uh, certain cases, he invested again. Otherwise, it is institutional investors uh, who are and they have uh, insight into what you are doing. And, they, and, they, uh, and you, you have got, they can see through, you cut this expedition in order to do this. They, 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 if you explain this is what you are doing for this purpose, they will be able to give you the time and be patient. My only complaint that you asked a question whether they are mature enough, uh, kind of, they, they are. But my complaint about other investment, uh, you know, the analyst fund manager is huge turnaround. Every quarter you will meet somebody else. So once in six months, you know there are. Uh, he will be in this fund. He will move to that fund. He will move to that. Fund. That is the frustrating. Otherwise, uh, um, Malishmi, as a one area which I would love to know, in the last six months we have seen a slew of these new age companies without a 
but profit to top off in this in the market with, with patchy success. Now, they were investors, they were private equity investors who had funded these companies and they were encouraging them to do marketing work. Now that it is listed, do you expect them to change their narrative? No, that is uh, again true because as a private company, there is uh, a lot of room and as we all know in the past few years all this has uh, private equity investments or you know the venture space has really exploded because of easy money. And uh, uh, so then obviously when you go into the public markets you become a lot more answerable and accountable to public shareholders. The expectations are definitely very different. And how much, again it comes back to the same thing, how do you build your narrative, how do you, how you keep narrative and you can always uh, you know, steer to a direction and say hey, uh, we are doing this because we are building this business here or we are building a brand here, look at Amazon, you know, Amazon did not uh, uh, do uh, net profits for, for a long long time but they were able to convince the market they were investing for the future. And they have to, they have, if they want to dominate the space, they have to. And if you, if you heard Sam the report, e-commerce is about 4,000 crores and Amazon has a big, big chunk of that. So that's, they've actually got to monetize in advertising, right? By the way, Vikram, that after four decades of working in world uh, economy companies, if they can get a job in a company where you will make more loss and more burning of money, at the very end. Very of course. Okay, on that, one last word from each of the panelists on accountability. What do you think? What is the kind of accountability you think that a CEO should sort of project to the market? What is, what, yeah, basically, was that that the CEO should project? Well, the box talks are the CEO statement. So he has to, he's accountable for the entire performance. And uh, if there's expectation uh, built up which is reflected in the share price today, he has to live up to that expectation. Yeah. Long-term value creation. It's not the quarterly results. No. Even after I decide or retire, the foundation that is laid should create value for the company over a long period of time. In that context, brand is very important. Uh, sorry, uh, the you know the brand is talked about. And you will find it in many acquisitions. The valuation of the company, dying alone, brand will be talked about, and it will have a huge value. Absolutely. So, um, because we are talking in the context of stock markets, Buffett has a brilliant quote which says that markets are behave like uh, investors behave like a voting machine in the short run and a weighing machine in the long run. So in the short run they just say who vote for the most popular and in the long run they obviously give value for the most weighty uh, uh, companies. But you guys, if you look at Mahalishmi's display picture in a WhatsApp, Warren Buffet is, is displaying something into a year. And that's probably what he just told her. Thank a big applause for this wonderful panel. Thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, the applause needs to be roaring. What a fabulous uh, panel discussion. This is. We just request our panelists to please uh, step in the center for a group photograph. Our, uh, just requesting you please stand in the center for a group photograph. And also at this moment, as we have our panel on the stage, we are going to request Arok Jalan, the MD, Lakshya Media Group, to kindly join us on the stage and give a memento to all our panelists. Ladies and gentlemen, a huge, huge round of applause once again, and thank you so much, Mr. Jalan, for joining us.